the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> Ah, yes. The sweet smell of victory. Hmm. Refreshing. Thank you for joining me on this Friday afternoon. You're in the lab room. I'm your host, Lou, and I'm feeling good right now. Off to a 1-0 start. The Giants took care of business. Did not think it was going to be that easy or that convincing uh, of a fashion. However, I told you I didn't think that the Carolina Panthers were ready for primetime. And they looked like a team that was shell-shocked, that the spotlight was just too big for. And so they went on national TV and embarrassed themselves. 36-7. to Giants took care of business. Guys stepped up. I rammed his body and I tapped my imaginary cap to you. You stepped up. Big ball game from you. I saw a little bit of flashes from Andre Brown last week. In watching that Tampa Bay Bucks game, I was impressed with what he did, and he just continue continues to impress. I'm not sure if when Ahmad Bradshaw comes back healthy that this guy isn't still going to get some carries. And so look for Andre Brown to be someone that's going to be around in this Giants backfield uh, for many more weeks to come. This Giants team was effective. They converted on third downs. Eli Manning, Eli Manning was comfortable in the pocket. He was finding receivers. He was de- he was decisive where he wanted to go with the football. Once he made up his mind, he got the ball there accurately, gave his receivers a chance to make plays after the catch, and that's what they did. Victor Cruz had a good game. Ramses Barton had a breakout football game. Andre Brown had a great game. Martellus Bennett ate up that uh, Panther secondary as well. They just looked good in all facets of the game. The defense was getting after Cam Newton. He looked like he didn't want to run. I, in the two losses that the Panthers have this year, Cam Newton looked like he tried to make a point to prove to people that he's a pocket passer. You don't have to prove anything to anyone, young man. You are a special breed of quarterback in this league. And the reason why you're special is because you're a dual threat. You have the ability to pass from the pocket, and when that doesn't work, and you think that you see something that you can take advantage of, you tuck it and run. And you didn't do that last night. And the Giants were able to get to you because of it. You were staying in the pocket way too long, giving them a chance to get to you, giving giving them a chance to sack you. You're not supposed to get sacked, at least not by one defender, because you're standing in the pocket too long. That's not the Cam Newton that we saw last year. The Cam Newton we saw last year was decisive. Either I'm going down the field or I'm running. And that first guy, whoever it is, if it's a free rusher, he's not sacking me. The first guy won't get me. And they were getting to you often last night, and it was often the first guy. And that was disappointing, and that was the same thing that happened to you against Tampa Bay. You decided that you weren't going to run. You didn't run. The Bucks got to you, frustrated you. When you did decide to run, they bottled you up, and you didn't get it done. You went back to running and being a dual threat last week against the uh, Saints. And look what happened. Look what the outcome was. A, a W for your team. You go back to trying to be a pocket passer, which you can be, but you weren't finding guys open. And so the next best thing, if you're Cam Newton, is put it down and run. Pull the ball down, tuck it away, take off. You didn't do that. I thought you made it too easy on this Giants defense. You made it easy on them to be able to know where you were going to be. They found you time and time again, got your team off the field on third downs, and the result 36-7 36-7 to seven loss at the hands of the Giants at home on national television. Woo, that was a tough one to take if you're a Panthers fan. And nonetheless, Panthers are now 1-2, and two, Giants are 2-1, and I got a much-needed victory to start off the Week 3 slate of games. And so, I'll take it. I will take it, and I'm going to run with it as fast as I can and make this week count.
And so we get right in to the slate of games this week. And I start with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers traveling to the Dallas Cowboys in a game that features two teams coming off of bad losses for two different reasons. The Tampa Bay Bucks coming off a bad loss because they dominated the Giants for three quarters before surrendering a sizable fourth quarter lead to the Gi Giants, uh, giving up 22 points to them in the fourth quarter. Eli Manning was on fire, unconscious, as he was destroying that Tampa Bay Buccaneers secondary uh, to the tune of 510 yards. And so that was a game, if you're a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan, player, coach, staff, you feel like you let one slip away. You look across the field at the Cowboys, their loss was ugly for a different reason. They just didn't show up. They got off the bus in Seattle, but they never showed up at the stadium. And that game was over before it started. Felix Jones set the tempo, set the pace, and the tone of the football game with the opening kickoff fumble. Cowboys really never recovered from that as they lost an ugly game to the Seattle Seahawks, 27-7. And so they're looking to bounce back. This is their home opener. First game at home this season in the 2012 season. And they had to wait till week three to do so. And so their fans should be hyped. Again, the Cowboys, they have one of those casual fan bases. So you just never know if they're going to show up and show out. But it doesn't matter. The Cowboys are excited to be home. The Buccaneers are playing their second straight game on the road. Shiano won his uh, home opener, his first game of the season. But I don't know if this Bucks team is ready to go on the road in a, in a tough place to play against a tough team in Dallas. Don't let last week's game fool you. Seattle is a tough place to play. Seattle is a team that always plays the Cowboys tough, and especially when at home. And the Cowboys went on the road and laid an egg. That's not indicative of what this Cowboys team can do, however. And so I don't think the Cowboys are a playoff team, but the Cowboys will be a fringe playoff team. They'll be sniffing right around the playoffs probably when the season is done. And, but I don't think they're going to make it. But at home against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team who has a new head coach, new philosophy, still trying to find out which parts fit and what they're trying to do and trying to feel them their way into this new uh, regime, that being headed by head coach Greg Schiano, I think that the Cowboys are going to win this football game. I can't see them dropping two in a row, uh, the, the, the latter being one at home, their first of the season against the Tampa Bay Bucks team that is trying to forge an identity. Do they want to run the football? Do they want to pass it behind Josh Freeman's right arm? I'm not sure right now. The first game, it looked like a team that was going to come out and run the football, establish the run, go play action fake off of it, have Josh Freeman not make mistakes, uh, use the short passing game to set up uh, shots down the field. That was what they looked like in the first game when they won against the uh, Carolina Panthers. In week two, it's a totally different script. I guess they thought that the, the Giants secondary was weak, which it is, and undermanned, and, and they figured they would come out Guns are blazing. They they turned to Josh Freeman and said, "Are you ready to rock and roll?" And and he went out and he was throwing the ball all over the place. And so right now, I think they're just trying to figure out who they are on the offensive side of the football. Do they want to run the ball? Do they want to be a passing team? Are they a mixture of both? We don't know. I, I can't tell you right now after watching their first two games because they were two different, totally different game plans. And so uh, I just think that the Cowboys would be too much for them. This is going to be the first game that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers see a ferocious pass rush. I think DeMarcus Ware is going to get after them, force Josh Freeman to make quicker decisions than he had to a week ago where he was against the Giants sitting in the pocket and having time to deliberately figure out what he wanted to do with the football. I think this week he's going to have to think a lot faster, make a quicker decision, maybe be forced into a few turnovers and have that be the difference think the offense for the Cowboys is going to step up this week. They looked really bad last week, not in sync. I think they're going to get back on track against a Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. They gave up over 500 passing yards a week ago to Eli Manning and the, and the New York Giants. And so 
I have the Cowboys notching their second win of the season, going to 2-1 and one on the season, beating the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who will drop to 1-2, and two, beating them 26-16. to 16. And I don't see the Bucs having that high uh, point total that they had a week ago. I don't see them being an explosive offense. I don't think that's what they are. I think they took advantage of a giant secondary that was reeling from all the injuries, and they went out and had a good showing, but I don't think that that's a team that you can see uh, scoring 27, 33 points a week. I don't think that's who the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are. I think they're closer to this 16-point total that they put up in week one and that I have them putting up in week three. I think the Cowboys are going to take care of business, get the W. As we move on down the slate, the next game sees the Jacksonville Jaguars going to Indianapolis to take on the Indianapolis Colts. Family business. This is a family affair, and so... Anybody can take this game. Doesn't matter home or away. It's tough when family business is being conducted. But again, I think that Andrew Luck is the better quarterback in this football game. That's saying a lot, being that uh, Blaine Gabbert is a second-year man. Andrew Luck is a rookie. However, Andrew Luck has shown me more in just two starts than Blaine Gabbert has shown me over a season in, in three games or two games. And so... I'm more confident in what Andrew Luck brings to the table than what Blaine Gabbert brings to the table. And for that reason alone, I think that the Colts at home are going to be able to win this football game. It's going to be close. These teams play each other tight no matter what the circumstances. Even when Peyton Manning was a quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts and they were winning 10-plus games routinely every season, they struggled with the Jaguars. Didn't matter how bad the Jaguars were. Didn't matter how good the Colts were. They stuck. They struggled with the Jaguars. And I think this is going to be a tight matchup, tightly contested. But I think Andrew Luck is going to prove to be too much for this Jacksonville Jaguars defense. And I think that the Colts are going to get this one 24-20 to 20 at home to run their record to 2-1, and one, drop the Jacksonville Jaguars down to 0-3. So as we continue down the slate, we run into our next matchup between the Buffalo Bills and the Cleveland Browns. Now, the Browns have been getting better gradually over the first two weeks of the season. Week one, that offense was abysmal. Couldn't get out of its own way. Put the defense in bad positions, ultimately having the Eagles win the game on a last drive touchdown. Week two for the Browns saw a role reversal in that the offense actually was the dominant part of the team going down the field and scoring points. And its defense could not contain the Cincinnati Bengals as the Bengals outscored the uh, Browns to get the victory. And so we're going to see if the Browns as a team have grown enough to have both the offense and defense show up in the same game. As they go back home and try to notch their first victory of the season, standing in their way will be these Buffalo Bills who rebounded off of an ugly loss in week one to have an equally as impressive win in week two against the Kansas City Chiefs at home. And so this Buffalo Bills uh, football team can score points. We know that. If Ryan Fitzpatrick is not turning over the football, if he's being efficient, finding Stevie Johnson, C.J. Spiller, running the football as effectively as he's been doing since last season, if he continues to do what he's been doing, and his defense starts getting pressure on the quarterback. They had a number of sacks last week. I still wasn't impressed with their pressure. I thought their sacks came from Matt Castle holding on to the ball too long and not because of them just generating a hot and heavy pass rush, as I like to call it. I thought that they were aided by... Matt Castle not knowing what he wanted to go and not knowing what he wanted to do uh, with the football. And so I need to see more from this Buffalo Bills defense. I need to see more pass rush. I need to see them stopping the run more effectively. I need to see them getting turnovers and being the Buffalo Bills team that started the season last year 5-2. and two. I haven't seen that team yet. Don't know if I'm going to see that team, but I'm holding out hope that that Buffalo Bills team is somewhere around because they were a fun team to watch last year. But nonetheless, they're going on the road against the Cleveland Browns, and they're going to get a victory. I feel like the Browns are still a team 
in transition. A lot of young parts. A lot of young players. Young at wide receiver. Uh, Travis Benjamin. You look at um, Josh Gordon. You also take a look at Greg Little. And, of course, they're young at quarterback and running back with Brandon Whedon and Trent Richardson. And so there's a lot of growing to do for this Cleveland Browns offense on the defensive side of the football. They've been playing solid football, but last week I thought they took a huge step backwards. They allowed the Cincinnati Bengals to really take advantage of them in the passing game. And I thought they did an excellent job in week one against the Eagles, but then they took a step back last week. Let's see what they do this week at home. Maybe being back at home is the antidote for this defense to play better. Again, they need both the offense and the defense to show up in the same game. They haven't had that yet, and that's why they're 0-2. I'm not sure they're going to have that happen again this week as I have the Buffalo Bills going to Cleveland on the road, notching a victory by the score of 27-20. to And so that'll take the Bills to 2-1 on the season. That'll drop the Cleveland Browns to 0-3. I don't have the Browns winning many games this season. They're a young football team trying to find out what it means to win in the National Football League. I'm not a big fan of their coach, Pat Shermer. I think he doesn't make enough in-game adjustments. I think he allows too many plays to go um, unchallenged when there are opportunities for his team to gain an advantage by him throwing the red challenge flag. I just think he's a passive head coach that's allowing uh, teams to take advantage of his football team and not doing anything about it as the head coach. And so not a big fan of Pat Shermer. I'm not a big fan of this Cleveland Browns team because they're so young. They don't have the experience. And so they've gonna, they're have going to have a lot of growing pains. And I see them losing their third straight to start uh, this 2012 NFL season to the Buffalo Bills 27-20. to More family business. The New York Jets travel to Miami to take on the Miami Dolphins. And what looks to be a solid game on paper. But again, the Dolphins lit up the scoreboard against the Oakland Raiders a week ago. And so you're thinking, hey, maybe this Miami Dolphins team is going to move along a lot faster than we once suspected. Don't fool yourselves. The Oakland Raiders are a bad football team. The Dolphins are not terrible, but they're not a good football team either. However, the Raiders are terrible. The Dolphins are so-so. So-so beats terrible. Now, the so-so supposed to blow out terrible? Most times, no, it doesn't. But the Raiders are bad. Dolphins took advantage of it. Don't get carried away, however. This Jets football team looked impressive in week one. Thought they had opportunities in week two on the road against the Steelers, but they weren't ready for that kind of test. They weren't ready to go on the road to Pittsburgh and win that game. That's not who they are. That's not where they are in their maturation at this point in the season yet. Maybe in week 12, 13, they'll start to build up some momentum and be able to win a game like that on the road. Right now, though, that's not where they are. This, however, is a different road test. This is in the division, a team they know all too well in the Dolphins. New head coach, Joe Philbin, someone they haven't seen before. He's going to bring a little bit of a different uh, style and flavor to this matchup. The Jets don't care. The Jets are going to go into this game, dominate the uh, Dolphins on the defensive side of football. They're going to smother and stifle uh, rookie uh, quarterback Ryan Tannehill, force him into mistakes. They're going to have to bottle up Reggie Bush. If they allow Reggie Bush to get off as the Raiders did, this could be a long day for the Jets. I don't see it happening, however. I think the Jets are going to come in, play sound defense. Off of that defensive performance that they're going to put forth on these Dolphins, I think Mark Sanchez is going to be able to get through this game without making many mistakes, not looking to have to win the game, but just augment what should be a solid running attack against this Dolphins defense. Come in, get a solid victory on the road against a divisional opponent, handle their family business as they're supposed to, 
24 to 13 over these Dolphins. I think the Jets are the better team here. They're going to prove it on the road against these Dolphins. Go in, get a victory, and move on. This will take the Jets record to 2-1 and one if they are successful, and this will drop the Dolphins to 1-2 and two on the season if they do, in fact, lose this football game. Up next on the slate of games, if you've been watching the show on the Wednesday edition of In the Lab Room, I gave you my sole survivor pick. This is that game. This is that pick. The Kansas City Chiefs 0-2 on the season. A matchup of two 0-2 teams go on the road in the Superdome against a hungry, starving New Orleans Saints football team. They're desperate for a win this weekend. There's no other way to say it. They have to have this football game. There's no, oh, it's early. There's no such thing as a must win this early in the season. If they lose, they got a game next week. That's not a must win. You can have all of that. You can say whatever you want to say. I'm telling you right now, these Saints need this football game. They lose this game. Go 0-3. And look, losing this game isn't like the first two weeks of the season. They lost to two dual-threat quarterbacks in the first two weeks of the season. Uh, offenses that were hard to contain. Understandably so how they could lose uh, to teams that put forth an offense with a quarterback that can both run and pass and create mismatches in, in the defense. Understandably so that the, the Saints went down in the first two weeks of the season. That's a tough draw. Again, back-to-back -back weeks of Robert Griffin III and Cam Newton in successive weeks. Tough to have those two teams staring at you back-to-back -back weeks and have to have to defend those guys. Tough. Tough to do. Tough for anybody in this league to have to do that back-to-back -back weeks. Don't know if anyone else has that kind of draw, where they have the Panthers and the Redskins in successive weeks. That was hard for the Saints. Normally, though, the Saints would have taken care of business in past years. Not the case this year, though. Nonetheless, they can't afford to lose to the Chiefs. The Chiefs are struggling right now. They're in free-fall mode. If the New Orleans Saints can't beat the Chiefs at home, they can pack it in for the rest of the season. They can forget about making any noise in the NFC, let alone the NFC South. They can forget about making any noise, period, in the NFC. They have to have this one. And I'm not expecting them to just win this game. I'm expecting them to blow the Kansas City Chiefs out at home. I'm talking about taking care of business, looking like a team that can score 34 points, looking like the team of 2011 that was putting up big numbers on teams at home in the Superdome. I'm expecting big things from this Saints offense this weekend against the Kansas City Chiefs. And just like uh, th that offense, I'm expecting the defense to be able to bounce back and play good football against this Chiefs offense as well. The Chiefs are struggling on both sides of the football. This isn't the same team last year that was ranked sixth and, and stopping the pass and 11th overall in total defense. This isn't the same team from two years ago that ran a football with Jamal Charles, led the league in rushing, and made it to the playoffs, winning the AFC West, posting a 10-6 and six mark. This isn't that same football team. This is a team looking for an identity, looking to find themselves, looking for Romeo Cornell to step up and get it done as a head coach, to get his first win as a Kansas City Chiefs in the 2012 season. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen this week because this New Orleans Saints team is desperate. They need it bad and they're in a comfortable position at home somewhere where they're familiar and they know how to get it done. This Saints team is going to come out and play like a team that has nothing to lose and everything to gain and I expect them to take it to the Kansas City Chiefs early and often in this football game and notch their first victory of the season, taking their record to 1-2, and two, dropping the Saints or oh, excuse me, dropping the Kansas City Chiefs to 0 and 3. I expect the Saints to win this football game 34 to 17, getting their first win of the season and starting to try to turn this thing around uh, in the 2012 season because it's plenty of time. This season is nowhere near over. They have plenty of time to turn this thing around. The Falcons have a tough game this weekend. They could easily drop their first of the season. And just like that, they could be one game behind the Falcons in the division. 
and they still have to play each other two times. This this division is gone nowhere. They're still right there in the thick of things. But they got to have this one. Absolutely, positively have to have it, and I think they're going to get it. 34-17 win for the Saints over the Kansas City Chiefs. Running their record to 1-2 and two on the season and dropping the Chiefs to 0-3. Romeo Cornell has to do something fast. He is really running out of time in his short stint with the Kansas City Chiefs. It's not starting good. And in this league, in this day and age, coaches don't get a lot of time to make things work, especially when they're not getting it done and it's not looking promising. If Romeo Cornell can find a way to win five or six games this year, it's pretty safe to say that he'll probably have a shot and coming back next year and giving it a run. But if they finish the season 2-14, and 3-13, and 13, I just don't know if Romeo Cornell will be able to get a shot in a second season, full season, as Chiefs head coach. And that would be very disappointing. I thought this was going to be a good opportunity for Romeo Cornell, the way he finished up uh, the 2011 season. But they've started out bad. And I think this thing is going to get worse before it's all said and done. Moving on to the next game. Of course, I'm biased. This is my favorite game of the weekend. It pits the Cincinnati Bengals traveling to FedEx Field to take on the Washington Redskins in their home opener. And this is a big game for the Redskins. First game at home in the 2012 season, the home debut of Robert Griffin III, I expect the crowd to be absolutely electric. I expect the scene at FedEx Field to be something that is not uh, normal for a Washington Redskins game. I expect the house to be packed full of burgundy and gold uh, with a smatter of white, all of it in support of the Redskins. I don't see this being a game where the Redskins have a lot of the opposing team infiltrating the stadium and taking over, as in the past. I think the the buzz around Robert Griffin III is real, and this town has waited for a long time to see a, a franchise QB come in and, and take over the reins and, and give us hope, and that's exactly what Robert Griffin III has done. And so not only is this environment, this stadium, going to be excited and electric for the first game of Robert Griffin III as the Washington Redskins uh, quarterback at home in the 2012 season. But I think that this is actually a good football team, better than I thought they would be at this point in the season. Are they a playoff team? No, I still don't think that they uh, changed my mind in that capacity. I started the season saying we were an 8-8 eight eight football team. I said we're a plus or minus one. Either we're going to be seven and nine, or we're going to be nine and seven, or eight and eight. And so uh, I haven't changed. I haven't deviated from that. But this is a win. This is a game the Redskins can and should be able to win at home. Granted, this Cincinnati Bengals team is no pushover. This is an offensive uh, team that, when they are clicking, are one of the most dangerous offenses in all of football. You look at A.J. Green, he is emerging very quickly as one of the best receivers in all of football. You look at the red rifle, Andy Dalton. He has come into the league and been steady as the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals. He's done nothing but come in and play solid football throughout his first 18 starts as an NFL quarterback in this league. You also look at some of the other weapons, Jermaine Gresham, rounding into one of the better tight ends in all of football. This is a young tight end that can get open, big body, big frame, knows how to get open, huge hands, catches the football. He's rounding into a nice tight end in this league. Also, they went out and got Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. I'm enamored with Andrew Hawkins, this smallish hybrid receiver slash running back that they have. He's about 5'9", 5'8", 5'9". Just a little jitterbug reminds me a lot of Darren Sproles, except he's a, a threat down the field in the passing game. And Darren Sproles is a running back, so he's out of the backfield. This guy can get it out of the backfield, can get it down the field. He's dangerous. This is someone the Redskins are going to have to keep tabs on. This Cincinnati Bengals team on offense 
is scary. You look at their defense, and they have some parts over the Geno Atkins is playing out of his mind. And uh, he's he's every time I watch the Bengals, he flashes. I see Geno Atkins, and I say that is a problem along that defensive front. You look at this Bengals team, though, on defense, and they can be exploited. That secondary has a lot of uh, guys in transition. They went out and got Terrence Newman, a castaway off of the Cowboys roster. You look at Taylor Mays, someone who was drafted by the 49ers to come in and play. Couldn't do anything but be more than a special teams contributor. Now he's a starter, takes bad angles, uh, is not always as disciplined as he needs to be in the secondary. And so he's someone that can be taken advantage of. I think this Cincinnati Bengals team can be taken advantage of on the defensive side of the football. And that's what I expect the Redskins to be able to do with Robert Griffin III at quarterback. I expect them to be able to explore uh, different formations. Uh, as they've done in the first two weeks, use those formations and uh, a few gadget plays to be able to exploit this Cincinnati Bengals defensive uh, unit, get points on the scoreboard, make it tough on Andy Dalton and the rest of that group to keep up scoring points, make them feel the pressure of having to keep pace and allow this defense of the Redskins to pin their ears back and get after the quarterback. This defense of the Redskins has been porous in the first two weeks. So the Cincinnati Bengals have to be licking their chops right now, thinking that they can take full advantage of this defense. And rightfully so, the Redskins' defense has been very, very questionable in the first two football games. In the first game against Drew Brees and the Saints, I thought they were phenomenal. Although they gave up 32 points on the scoreboard, I thought they were phenomenal in that game. And so they got a pass from me there. Because Saints and Drew Brees and that offense, that's a powerful juggernaut of an offense. And so to hold them to 32 points and in the way they did it, I thought it was impressive. But then you go on the road the next week against the Rams, a team that is not explosive, a team that is not to be confused with a powerhouse on offense, score 31 points on this defense. And Danny Amendola looked like an all-pro receiver against this secondary and so that changed my mind about what this Redskin defense was all about. Granted, they had injuries all along that, that defense, one at each level and a, and a main injury at each level. Josh Wilson, the corner, went out with a concussion. Uh, Brian Arakpo tore that pec muscle, gone for the season. He missed a good portion of the game. And Adam Carricker uh, tore um, something in his knee. He's done for the season. He's gone. And he went out relatively early in the football game. And so at each level, the Redskins defense was missing a key contributor. Nonetheless, you still don't give up 31 points to a Rams offense that doesn't score 30 routinely. Sam Bradford looked uh, like an elite quarterback against this defense. And so there's questions to be answered on this defense. Will they get Brandon Merriweather back? Will Josh Wilson be able to play? How effective will those guys be? Um, we don't know. All in all, though, the Redskins should be able to do enough on the offensive side of the football to win this game at home. I think the crowd will carry them, will give them a little bit more of a boost and give them the spark that they need at home to beat a tough Cincinnati Bengals team. I like the Redskins in this one, 27-23 to over the Cincinnati Bengals, taking their record to 2-1, and one, dropping the Cincinnati Bengals to 1-1 and two on this young season. Speaking of the St. Louis Rams, they're next up on the docket as they travel to Chicago to take on these Chicago Bears. And what a difference a week makes. I've said that before when talking about the Cowboys, and I'll say it again when talking about the Chicago Bears. I had someone come up to me, and I had a buddy also as well text me I got the Bears going to the Super Bowl for the NFC after their week one performance against the Indianapolis Colts. And I told him and I told the other fellow that said the same thing to me, it's one game, it's the Indianapolis Colts, and it's the Chicago Bears. Relax. This Bears team is not who you think they are. Not after one week. You can't say that. 
And, and lo and behold, what do you know? All of a sudden, the Green Bay Packers host the Chicago Bears, toss Jay Cutler around a bit, have him throw a few interceptions, and all of a sudden, the sky is falling in Chicago. And so, pump your brakes on any Chicago Bears talk, whether it be of Super Bowl, whether it be of demise. None of that is necessary this early in the season. The Bears are fine. They're going to compete in the NFC, in the NFC North as well. They're going to be a team around. They're going to make the playoffs. I feel that they can avoid the injury bug. They've already been bitten by the injury bug. Matt Forte will not play in this game. And so they're going to have to find ways to run the ball. This is exactly why they went out and got Michael Bush for situations like this because we know Matt Forte is a big part of the Chicago Bears offense. And when you're used as often as he is, there's a chance that you're going to get hurt. You're more susceptible and exposed to being injured. And so Michael Bush is going to pay dividends for this Chicago Bears team in situations like this where Matt Forte can't go. Now, this Chicago Bears offense starts up front. Their whole problem, when they're not clicking, when they're not uh, the Chicago Bears that's explosive, that can play with any team in the league, it starts up front. The reason why they don't perform at maximum efficiency is because this offensive line can't keep Jay Cutler upright. They can't open holes for Matt Forte. And so this offensive line is where it starts for the Chicago Bears. If they can't protect Jay Cutler, they won't win football games. It's as simple as that. And Mike Tice was promoted from offensive line uh, coach to the offensive coordinator for a reason because that offensive line is the key to the Chicago Bears. Not only this offense, this team. If they can't score points, this, this Chicago Bears defense is no longer the defense of 2002 or 2006 where they can stop teams from scoring, score points on their own on the defensive end and carry the Chicago Bears team. Those days are over. This is a older, long in the tooth defense. That's a that's a veteran group. That's wily. That knows how to get it done. But they're not going to be electric. They're not going to stop you from scoring, force you into turnovers, and take those turnovers and score points. They're not going to shut you down like a like a 49ers defense of today. This present day 49ers defense is much like the Bears defense when they were in the mid-2000s when they were trying to go to the Super Bowl virtually every other year behind Erlacher and company. That's not what this uh, defense is about anymore. They're about holding teams down, giving the offense every opportunity in the world to score points and win ball games, as they did against the Packers. That, that defense did nothing wrong in that game. They, they bent but they did not break against the Packers. The Packers only put up 23 points. Jay Cutler threw four interceptions in that ball game. They should have given up way more than 23 points, but their defense stood up. They bent, but they didn't break. The offense, however, has to step up for the Chicago Bears. They have to be better. This offensive line has to get it in gear. They have to protect Jay Cutler. And we know Jay Cutler's a hot hit. So I don't know why the media is making so much of Jay Cutler getting in the face of Jamarcus Webb. That's what Jay Cutler does. That's his M.O., and that's how he's always been. He's a fiery guy. He says what's on his mind. He does some things that you probably don't want to see out of your starting quarterback, but that's Jay Cutler. You knew what you were getting into when you made the deal to acquire Jay Cutler and paid him that money. You knew what you were getting into. So uh, all that... Extra talk about Jay Cutler makes no sense to me. Bottom line, offensive line needs to get it done. They do their job, the weapons are there. Brandon Marshall, Earl Bennett, um, Alshon Jeffrey, they have weapons. Devin Hester, they got guys they can get the football to. But the offensive line has to give Jay Cutler time to survey the field and find those weapons and get the ball into their hands. Now, I spent that much time talking about the Chicago Bears, and that's no slight to the St. Louis Rams. In fact, 
let's talk about these Rams because that was an impressive win they had a week ago against the Washington Redskins. Now, I thought that the Rams took advantage of these replacement officials. Jeff Fisher, to me, has always been a coach that coach an aggressive brand of football. He always pushes the rules to the limit and sometimes goes slightly overboard. And that's no knock on him. If you can get away with it, why not? He's been getting away with it for years. And so this Rams team is no different. That's why his first addition as coach of the uh, Rams when he was hired was to go out and get Cortland Finnegan because that's the brand of football that he encourages. Guys going out there, being a little extra after the whistle has been blown and causing uh, the opposing team to lose their cool. Titus Young, headbutt. Uh, Cortland Finnegan in week one. Josh Morgan threw the ball at Cortland Finnegan in week two. Do you see the trend here? That's what Cortland Finnegan does. That's what this St. Louis Rams team is doing right now. They're being extra. They're, they're changing the culture in St. Louis. No longer is this a team that's soft, that's going to allow you to batter and bruise Sam Bradford. They're going to come in and do that to you instead. They're going to hit you first before you can get to them. And when you go to respond, you get caught. And so this Rams team is looking to change their whole identity. No longer are they the Rams that are coming in just looking for a place to fall down and curl up into the fetal position. They're coming out fighting. They're coming out swinging. And this Bears team better be ready. They better be ready to protect Jay Cutler. Because if they're not, Robert Quinn, Chris Long, and company are going to put pressure on him. This Rams secondary is going to be physical with their receivers. Get into the head of Brandon Marshall. Force him to start to lose his focus. If he's not getting the football, he'll get frustrated and things will happen in this game. And not good for the Bears. So they need to come out, set the tempo, establish how this game is going to go. Do not allow the St. Louis Rams to dictate how this game is going to go by getting pressure. The first two games for the Chicago Bears have started with sacks on Jay Cutler on the offensive side of the football. That can't happen in week three. If the Rams sense any kind of hope in this game, any kind of weakness on that defensive or offensive line of the Bears, this could be a long day. And if this officiating crew is not ready to make sure that this game stays in check from the beginning, the Bears could be in trouble. But the Bears are home. That that St. Louis Rams team that you saw a week ago, I thought was a byproduct of the officiating and uh, also uh, a byproduct of them being at home. They had some home cooking. I don't see them getting away with as much as they did a week ago. The, the Bears are at home. They're the better football team. They need to show it. I have them doing so in a tight one, 23-19, to 19, running their record to 2-1 and one and dropping the St. Louis Rams to 1-2 and two on the season. Next up on the slate of games is probably the hottest and most feared team in the NFL right now. As the San Francisco 49ers pack up that devastatingly dominant defense, did I just use three Ds consecutively? I think I just did. And take that on the road to face the Minnesota Vikings, who by many accounts don't stand a chance in this game. I beg to differ. Anytime you're at home in the NFL, that gives you a chance. Don't care who you're playing. Don't care how bad you are. If you're at home, you stand a chance. Albeit a small one, you still stand a chance. And, and this... Minnesota Vikings team has the cards stacked against them in this deck when playing the 49ers for several reasons. Number one being Christian Ponder, a second-year quarterback, going in against a very, very scary defense that loves to get after the quarterback, force turnovers, and, and they play such a clean brand of football do the 49ers. They don't make mistakes. They force you into mistakes turn your mistake into points, and then take their ball when they get it on offense, move it down the field, and get more points. 
and, and the scary thing about the 49ers is they're, they're just good at every portion of the football game. They're good at special teams. They're good at offense. They're good at defense. And the special teams, all you have to do with David Akers is get it to about the 40-yard line and you're in field goal range. So all this 49ers offense is looking to do is just stay ahead of down and distance. They don't mind having a drive stall out at the 37-yard line. David Akers will just kick a 54-yard field goal. That's three points. Three more points on the scoreboard for you to have to make up against that defense. And that's what's scary about this San Francisco 49ers team is that they don't make mistakes. They make you make mistakes. And then they just keep scoring points, whether it's a field goal or a touchdown. They don't care. Makes them no difference. All, the way they see it is that's just more points for you to have to try to score against this defense. They don't care if they kick six field goals and score 18 points. Are you going to score 18 points? Probably not. And that's the way they feel. It's, hard. it's going to be a tough task for this Minnesota Vikings team because their strength is running the football. The 49ers' strength is stopping the run. So there you have it. Your strength is negated by the other team's strength, which is more dominant than your strength, if that's not confusing to you. And so now you have to go to a second-year quarterback and ask him to get it done with limited weapons. Poor Percy Harvin. He's a monster on that team. I see why he wanted to be traded. On a good team, he would be absolutely lethal. On the Vikings, he's he's special. But you can overcome Percy Harvin because there's just not enough there. Especially when you're playing a team like the San Francisco 49ers who are going to go on the road and get a W against a Minnesota Vikings team that, for all intents and purposes, just don't have enough to win this football game. And so I have the San Francisco 49ers beating the Minnesota Vikings on the road 23-10, to taking their record to 3-0, and dropping the Vikings to 1-2 and two on the season. 